Welcome everyone to Buddhist Global Relief's retreat to welcome in the new year. My name is Trisha and I'm on the staff here at PGR. Um, I'm gonna post one more time a link to today's schedule. Um, if you wanna click on that link now you'll, uh, to open the schedule in a window on your device, then you'll have it for the day. Uh, the schedule is also linked on the main registration page on our website. Um, I'm so glad that all of you have joined us for practice and reflection on the retreat theme today, um, sustaining hope in hard times. Buddhist Global Relief's vision statement is itself a model of hope in the Dharma. We say, we are inspired by the vision of a world in which debilitating poverty has finally been banished, a world in which all can avail themselves of the basic material supports of a meaningful life, food, clothing, housing, and health care. A world in which everyone can achieve a satisfactory level of education and freely pursue that which gives their life value and purpose. A world in which all people dwell in peace and harmony with one another and with the natural environment. May this weekend's retreat provide all of us with the wisdom and grace to work together toward this better world. Mm -hmm. um, I'm honored now to introduce Aya Dhammadipa, who will offer a Dhamma talk and lead us in a meditation session. Um, for those who weren't able to be with us last night, Aya is a BGR board member and is the founder of Dasanaya Buddhist Community in Alexandria, Virginia. She's a fully ordained bhikkhuni in the Theravada tradition and a Dharma heir in Soto Zen. Welcome, Aya. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. <clears throat> Beautiful. So again, yes, we are here for the New Year's 2024 retreat. And uh, this theme of hope in difficult times, sustaining hope in hard times. It's, uh, it's definitely a, a theme that I think BGR relates to addresses directly. And it's one that I want to speak about also more broadly today. But before I do any of that, I would like to begin with a guided meditation. I think that uh, having a taste of the actual, uh, some one of the actual practices that has come to us from the Buddha is a good way to get started this morning. And we're going to do just a, uh, a mindfulness of breathing meditation. And I'll give some guidance during that. So <clears throat> we'll do that for about 25 minutes or so. So you can go ahead and begin to Settle your body into a meditation posture. I like to begin with a bit of movement, just rocking the body gently from side to side and from front to back. Just loosening up any tendency to lean toward the computer. Maybe also moving the head loosening up any tension you find in the neck and the shoulders. Feeling the weight of your body supported by your seat or by the floor. And relaxing the belly. Allowing the body to settle right here, right now in this place.
slowly moving the attention upward, allowing the body to come into a balanced, upright posture. If you're sitting or standing, if you're lying down and just aligning the spine. And softening the eyes, softening the mouth. And perhaps by now, the sensations of the breath are coming to the forefront. And you can rest the mind on the sensations of the breath wherever that feels easy. Maybe at the tip of the nose or in the nostrils, in the throat or the chest. The diaphragm or even just the echo of the breath in the lower abdomen. Just find one place and rest the mind on the sensations of the breath. Allowing the breath to breathe the body naturally. And perhaps noticing whether there are any pauses between the in-breaths and the out-breaths. trying to change them at all, just observing the pauses. Staying curious about those natural moments of stillness between the exhalations and the inhalations.
And perhaps having found the pauses between the breaths, you can also observe the start of each part of the breath. Noticing those moments when impermanence is very apparent, the shift from stillness into movement. Staying with the sensations of the breath and allowing all other thoughts and sensations to recede into the background. Perhaps having found the pauses between the breaths and the start of each part of the breath, then the mind is willing to ride along the length of the breath. To ride all the way along from the start until arriving at the next pause.
Now opening the attention to the whole body. <clears throat> Still aware of the breath, the breathing, the body, the in breath and the out breath. and allowing the whole body to become even more still, more steady and relaxed. And in these last few minutes of the meditation, still aware of the in-breaths and the out-breaths, just checking in for any pleasant feelings in the body or in the mind.
And that brings us to the end of our meditation this morning. That was refreshing. So that was the first five steps of the 16 steps of mindfulness of breathing on the Panasati. <clears throat> now I'm going to go ahead and move on into the Dhamma talk. <clears throat> and I will begin by paying homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arado samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arado samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arato Samma Sambhutasa Bhutang Tamang Sanghang Namasami Yes, so our theme is hope. Hope in hard times. And in my experience, and from what I read of the early Buddhist teachings, I think that the Buddha Dhamma is fundamentally hopeful. Starting with the Buddha immediately after his awakening and spending some 45 years teaching. And he didn't go around saying, I'm the only one who can do this. He went around saying, Actually, I'm happy to teach anyone who is willing to listen how to do this, how to awaken to absolute freedom and peace. And what he held out was not a hope for the becoming of some fixed state or becoming uh, some superhuman, but rather that by personally, individually working together with the principles, working in harmony rather than in resistance to the principles of reality that we could discover for ourselves this freedom and this joy and this peace amidst a suffering, changing, difficult world. He said, among those who are angry, we will walk without anger. And I want to share just a little bit about how that might happen and then speak a little bit about the broader, even broader context for that. But uh, just to say a few words from suttas in which the Buddha speaks about this uh, beautiful hope that, uh, that he taught. So I'm uh, going to share a little bit. I'm, we're not going to go into a lot of detail about it, but a little bit about uh, Anguttara Nikaya 11.2. So, number discourse from the Pali Suttas, uh, the numerical discourses of the Buddha. This is uh, Venerable Bodhi's translation that I'm working from there. Uh, and uh, from the chapter of 11th, number two, although there are several at the beginning of this chapter that are all expounding this same sequence of events. But I particularly like the second one because in it, the Buddha begins by saying, for a person, a virtuous person, a person who's practicing 
ethics, there is no need to exert their volition. No volition need be exerted, is the translation that Bhante gave us. Let non-regret arise in me. It is natural that non-regret arises in one who is virtuous, in one whose behavior is virtuous and ethical. And for one without regret, it's natural that joy arises. Joy, a particular kind of joy, the Pali word for it is pamoja. And pamoja is joy that comes from reflecting on your good choices, reflecting on your practice, reflecting on the skillful things that you've done with your life. Just as is mentioned here in the sutta. So right away what the Buddha is saying is that we, by making choices that accord with the principle, with, with our understanding, perhaps we could say it that way, of the principle of kama, or karma in Sanskrit, or kama in Pali, that we can see that we put in the positive conditions in our life. That by living an ethical life, then, and that's what an ethical life means. It means following those precepts, those five precepts that we spoke about yesterday. Yeah, so if you have the big tome with you, I'll tell you, it's on page... Uh, 1554. So by, what we mean by an ethical life is following those precepts, those five precepts that we spoke about yesterday, but also generally taking up a life of non-harming, a life of profound honesty and respect for oneself, for other beings. That is what we mean by taking up a life of virtue. And when we make those kinds of choices in our life, then we are, in essence, engaging the function of kama in a way that it will help to produce positive conditions known as vipaka, those are results of kama. It will produce these beneficial conditions in our life so that we can feel non-regret. We can look at the choices that we've made and say, oh, wow, yes, look, I'm living an upright life. I can feel good about that. And I can find joy in that. And so ethics is said to, to be the foundation for a mind that is free of the agitation of remorse, right? So restlessness and remorse is one of the hindrances, right? this kind of agitation that arises in the mind. So as an example of that, I will say from my personal life, at a time when I was living with a person that I found to be very difficult, very harmful to me, and I would lie to keep the peace, so to speak. That's what I thought. I was doing. But then what I learned was that there is no peace in that for me. That I was always worried about the consequences of that. Would somebody find out? Or would I have to lie to this other person also? Or what happened if the lie came true? Or, various, or somebody found out about the lie and then they thought that I was lying about something that I was actually telling the truth about. So we see, we see very naturally the kind of agitation and restlessness and remorse that can come up when we're not living a virtuous life. So for this reason, we say that ethics is the foundation. But interesting, this aspect, right, of saying that it's not necessary to exert your volition. It's not necessary to, uh, as Bhante Tanisaro translated as, make an act of will. Or Bhante Sujato translates it as making a wish. It's not necessary to make a, a, an act of volition so that the non-remorse will come up. It just does because that is the natural consequence of a virtuous life, of a clear and non-agitated mind. 
So we go on a bit to the rest of the sutta. So the sutta speaks again about joy, about this joy of being able to reflect on your positive choices, your ethical choices in your life. That's beautiful. And then he goes on to say, for one who is joyful, it's natural that it's no, so let me just read the whole sentence. For one who is joyful, no volition need be exerted. Let rapture, or this is the word PD in Pali, uh, a kind of, uh, you, can, you might think of it as like a hot stimulated kind of joy, bodily and mental joy. No volition need be exerted. One doesn't need to make that kind of determination. It's natural that PT arises in one who is joyful, who has pomoja, who can reflect on living a virtuous life. And then it goes on. So I will go through it a little more quickly here in the center part. So then the body can become tranquil naturally, right? So why is all of this natural? Why is it that we don't need to engage? So we you might say that the PT arises, this is a shift in the sutta in my opinion, because PT typically, uh, it can happen off the cushion, but it typically arises initially at least in the meditation. So this is how PT arises from meditative states. And, um, and then it can happen much more frequently and throughout the day and so on. Uh, so that's another choice that we make, however, to continue to engage the practice. But as we're doing that, then again, the Buddha comes back and he says, for one with PT, then the body will naturally become tranquil. And for one with a tranquil body, a relaxed body, then it's not necessary to exert your volition and say, may I become concentrated. Ah, so now we start to see the benefits, right? Then the mind becomes increased, is a willing to be more settled and more focused, more and more settled and more focused, right? Just working again with the natural principles of the body and the mind and the karma. So, and also the other principles that are at work, like impermanence and like, uh, you could say interconnection or conditionality. So then for one who is concentrated, this is now the Buddha speaks about the dawning of insight. For one who is concentrated, no volition need be exerted. Let me know and see things as they really are. It is natural that one who is concentrated knows and sees things as they really are. So you start to begin to have, you, you begin to have a much more clear understanding of the workings of the body and mind, of the workings of the environment in which you're interacting, of the workings of the world, literally, right? By, the, by this clarity that develops. So knowing and seeing things as they truly are. You could say another layer of refinement of this basic attitude of honesty that we started out with. Right? When we live an ethical life, we begin with an attitude of honesty and this honesty about how things are then develops into insight. It is natural that one will become disenchanted, or sometimes the translation is disillusioned. What does that mean? It means dropping off wrong view. When you know and see how things actually are, you drop off wrong view, and you start to have right view. You start to have an appropriate, more skillful, more compassionate understanding about the world. And then this uh, dispassion. So dispassion is very interesting and it's an important point for us in, relative to this hope in the middle, in the midst of hard times. So when we talk about dispassion, sometimes that sounds <clears throat> not so attractive. 
you know, I come from a Latina family, a Latino family, and passion was a big part of my experience growing up. And that was very important to us, you know. Passion meant that you cared, actually, um, when I was growing up. But now looking at this teaching in the suttas, when the suttas talk, speak about becoming dispassionate, what I want to suggest is that the way to understand this is that we are no longer looking externally for the development of that joy and that clarity and that peace that comes from that. That we have developed our own capacity to generate that through our practice. So there isn't this constant state of the push-pull and the ups and downs that come with the idea of having to get your joy from something that comes from outside. And you might notice already that the sutta has mentioned three different kinds of joy before we even got to, in fact, I missed one, right? After there, yeah, there was, there was the sukha. So let me just go back. So there is virtue leads to non-regret. Non-regret leads to joy, the joy of pamoja. And then pamoja leads to piti, this joyful rapture. And then piti leads to the body becoming tranquil. And then the tranquil body feels sukha, feels pleasure. And then from the pleasure, one, the mind becomes that kind of sukha. Then we have the various attributes of being able to place the mind, sustain the mind, and have piti and sukha. Those are the factors for jhana, for first jhana anyway, concentration. So, and then knowing and seeing things as they really are, and then disenchantment, dispassion, and so the sutta has mentioned all these ways in which we are capable of developing our own source of joy. Joy in the practice. Joy in living an upright life. Joy in having a mind that is more steady, and more clear. And finally, there is for one, who is dispassionate, no volition need be exerted. Let me realize the knowledge and vision of liberation. It is natural that one who is dispassionate will realize the knowledge and vision of liberation, or the knowledge and vision of freedom. So as the sutta concludes, and then the, the uh, Buddha repeats the sequence there one by one, and then he says, one stage flows on to the next stage. Each stage fills up for the going from the near shore to the far shore. So there's this beautiful fundamental hope within Buddhism that we have the conditions, we have the possibility of living a life of, of living a a life which is the path to absolute freedom and liberation. That is clear. That joy and that peace and that freedom is ours. And I wanna say the one thing that we, if we were to stop there, that would be beautiful, but that's incomplete because the other aspect, the most perhaps one of the most hopeful aspects of the Dhamma is that all of that happens within the context of the sasana. All of that happens within the context of community. We do our individual work, but we're only capable of doing that actually when that happens in the context of community. So there's also this beautiful hope within Buddhism that each of us can turn toward a life of service to one another, a life of supporting one another to walk this path, to be the role models in the world for ethics, for non-killing, for non-stealing, for non-sexual misconduct, for telling the truth, right? That we are also doing that 
in the larger context of our communities, supporting one another to walk the path, learning and teaching, right? And collectively being role models for others, right? That's one of the things that you see very frequently in the early Buddha Siddhas. And you see that the, the Sangha would be walking people, various practitioners, including the monastic Sangha would be walking around and people would say, hey, you, you, what, what are you practicing? Because you seem to really be at peace. You seem to be somebody who is clear about yourself, about the world. Tell me more. What's the teaching that helped you with that? So we, we also do this, not just in terms of our, the hope for our individual liberation, but that by doing so, we are naturally also having our, those effects in the world, being role models in the world, standing up for that in the world. <clears throat> and being profoundly of service. Being of service in a way that uh, doesn't get caught up in worldly agendas. You know, I was just talking to somebody yesterday and they were saying, you know, you can't say anything anymore. You can't even say ceasefire. You can't say stop because that to some people that means you're on one side or another. And yet the Dhamma is very clear, right? We have to stand for non-killing, non-harming. So Buddhism, you know, sometimes you hear folks talk about uh, that Buddhism isn't about hope or isn't about, and, that, and I think that that comes from the place of saying, of acknowledging that it is about knowing and seeing things as they truly are and not as we might wish them to be. Hmm? Both things externally and things internally. That's absolutely true. We have to come to that profound acceptance. But to stop there is to miss the hopefulness of the message that we can actually know and see things as they really work and actually work toward an inner and an outer well-being for all beings and manifest that and complete that, fulfill that path. In fact, I would say the Buddha had nothing but confidence that we could do that. Yeah. His final words. Vaya uh, Dhamma Sankara Sampama Sam Sampa what is it? Vaya Dhamma Sankara Apamadena Sampadeta. He says. Things, constructed things, are fleeting. They are falling apart. And so what is the response to that? The response to that is fulfill the way with diligence, with care. That's, that is the ultimate hope of Buddhism, that we can all fulfill this way. And by doing so, we are creating a hopeful world. So thank you for your kind attention. That's what I wanted to share today. And uh, so we have a bit of time for some question and answer, and then maybe I'll do a bit of chanting at the end there, and we'll uh, close for the morning session. So for the Q&A, here's the way we're going to do it is that uh, if you will raise your Zoom hand, so down at the bottom, well, for some people it's at the bottom, and for some people it's at the top, but wherever your menu bar is, you have 
uh, um, a menu item called reactions and under reactions, you can raise your hand. And in there, uh, if you have any concerns or doubts about actually just asking your question out loud, you're also welcome to send your question in the chat to Trisha Brick. She's the one who opened our session today. And you can uh, see, yep, there she's waving. Trisha Brick, her, her, uh, her, her Zoom name there says BGR staff. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll take some questions. You can unmute yourselves as I call on you. And uh, yes, David. Thank you, Aya. Thank, um, uh, Aya, uh, you know, sometimes I think we get caught up in this idea that it's all or nothing, that until we achieve total liberation, we can't know the peace and the joy that you talked about in this sutta. And I know as a person in long-term recovery, you know, I have found parts of my life, in this case, my recovery, that uh, from, from uh, alcoholism, that uh, I've found complete liberation there, you yeah. know, through the, the help of the Dhamma. You know, it's no longer an issue for me. You know, it's not a temptation, but it's not even something that bothers me. And I, uh, and I think there, I'm sure there's other areas that I could point to as well. But I was wondering if you would comment about that so that we don't leave thinking that we have to, you know, become an arahant in order to find freedom. But it, it happens in various stages along the way. And when we do, it's like we get a glimpse of nibbana. First of all, David, I want to say congratulations on your sobriety. I'm very happy for you. Much mudita. I know many, many people who are practitioners have felt supported by the Dhamma in their recovery. So that's wonderful and wonderful that you feel freedom from that uh, affliction, from that suffering. That's great. And yes, I want... Uh, uh, I mean, as I under, first of all, as I understand this sutta, the sutta is definitely saying we can feel um, joy and freedom and concentration all the way throughout our path. That's, that's uh, we're not waiting for some magical moment. And in fact, that moment of knowing and seeing things as they are, um, you know, you can have many of those. Um, but yes, I think it's critical to, to understand that when we talk about the cessation of suffering, that the cessation of suffering is happening potentially from moment to moment. There are many, many um, aspects of the cessation of suffering, and we can observe that time and time and time again. And that, yes, doesn't have to wait until we have uh, completed the path. But in terms of the glimpse of Nibbana, um, so I have, to, I have to say that, you know, from the traditional standpoint, Nibbana is a state that is complete, is not a state even, it is the complete lack of all conditioned phenomena. So it's not really a thing that you could imagine, you know, in your normal state of your, your regular uh, life like that. It would, it's, a, it's an experience which is completely absent any other markers, you know, like signlessness. It's even hard to understand what we mean when we say signlessness, but there are no markers of body or mind or perception or anything in the, when Nibbana is uh, experienced. So just to be clear about that piece of it, um, uh, but in terms of freedom, you absolutely can have, you can know uh, freedom in various uh, stages and steps along the way. And that, that is important part of Pomoja, just as uh, the Sutta says again, right? To remember that, recall that, acknowledge that, and take, take uh, joy in that and allow that joy to fuel the continuation of your path. So do we have another question or comment or reflection? Yes, Trisha. Um, I have a few questions from the chat. Okay. Um, the first question is, 
Is it arrogant to think of regular people as, quote, uninstructed, unquote, in order to deal with their hostile or difficult behavior? Hmm. Well, it can be arrogant or it can be not arrogant. Here's, here's I think that um, perhaps more helpful than that, or what I find more helpful than that, is to think about the fact that people are suffering, that people are suffering from their states of delusion. They're suffering from their states of misunderstanding. And that is what drives a lot of very, very difficult behavior. But so are they uninstructed? Well, technically they may, they may well be, but um, yeah, we, it's good to ask the question and to check in with yourself about that, right? Because um, uh, to, to set ourselves up as better than someone else is also a mistaken view. In fact, there's a very clear sutta about that as well, right? Not worse, not better, not equal to. Each individual person is a unique karmic constellation. And, uh, and so we have to be very careful about how we understand ourselves in relationship to others. And if anything, again, I would say, we would under, uh, underscore the sense of being of service to folks who are having such extreme suffering or such extreme delusion. Is there another one, Trisha? Since we don't have any other hands up. Um, I have one question that was just asked uh, what the sutta chapter and verses that you referenced. Yes, so again, it's, it's a numerical discourse. And it's from chapter 11, and it's number two. So Anguttara Nikaya, chapter 11, the book of 11s, Sutta number two. Sutta number one is the same thing, just, just talking about it for, in terms of the purpose and the benefit. And uh, Sutta number three is the same thing, talking about in terms of proximate cause. So, so that's the way to understand this sutta is to understand it in terms of putting in those uh, causes and conditions and then understanding that that works within the greater principles. That's, that's what's happening within our practice so that we don't become arrogant. That's part of it also is not to become arrogant to think that we are, it's just a recipe and we're just driving the boat from here, you know, from point A to point B. So... Um, I see that Gita has her hand up. Thank you, Aya. It's so wonderful to see you. Wonderful thank you, Bhante Bodhi. You. Yes. And thank you to all the organizers. We're so ever so grateful for this opportunity. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Aya, I have a question. It uh, doesn't have to particularly do with this uh, sutta. Uh, you know, as we, because we live in the lay life, so as we develop Nibida uh, and we're aware of the present moment in activity, whatever we're doing, from the minute that we wake up, we take refuge and take the precepts and follow the path, the Noble Eightfold Path. Mm -hmm. What is your understanding? And I just want to get an understanding. I, I'm aware of Nibida developing that, and it happens, you know. It's a slow process. It's a gradual path. Um, what is vimutti and viraga that you, from you, from the teachings that you've read, how you see these two words, vimutti and viraga? Mm. Well, we could talk a long time about those things. But I know. <laughs> Just briefly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... So to put it, let me put it uh, colloquially or in a way that's perhaps intuitive, which is to say that vimutti, so freedom or liberation, is when the, the insight or the, um, the visceral experience of reality shifts mm -hmm. in such a way 
that mm -hmm. again all wrong view falls off all greed hatred mm -hmm. and delusion falls off all right there's no way to hold on to that anymore mm -hmm. because the clarity about the nature of reality is such that it doesn't even make sense anymore you know it's like um yeah it's it's uh it's usually it has to be a moment where there is such a sense of release that mm -hmm. your whole view of the world shifts and that's why it's different than just an experience of nibbana for example or just a, an experience of you know one of the formless meditations you know boundless uh, space, for example, or things of that nature. It's like the Buddha, and this is why the Buddha went beyond, uh, you know, what he learned with Alar Kalama and Uddhika Ramaputta, mm -hmm. because it's because because there wasn't that those moments of the insight into dependent origination, right? Into how Kama works mm -hmm. and how that set of conditions where that chain could be broken. And when it's broken, right? That's what he saw. When it's broken, then this, 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 and this doesn't come into being, right? So that's how to understand, maybe we can have Bhante also say more about Vimuti, but just to also touch base on Viraga. So Viraga, you know, um, it's literally, said to be like this you know the stain and the odor coming out of the fabric right like mm. and uh so so it is about the elimination of the taints elimination of those things and you know when you're meditating maybe you can experience this uh when you're when you are meditating you can sometimes literally see the way in which the taints are are coloring the mind. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Thank um, you, Aya. Yes, Thank you're you. welcome. Maybe, uh, Venerable Bodhi, would you like to say a little something to this question? Or would or do you feel like that we're, uh, we've covered it? There's always more to say. <laughs> uh, it's just that the raga that is, this passion precedes vimuti or liberation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So viraga is actually maybe the process of the mind. Well, let's say, especially viraga, though we translate this passion, but it's the absence of raga. Raga is more like attachment mm -hmm. or lust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So viraga is the fading away. It's also another sort of implication of viraga. Because the original sense of raga is a dye, the dye that's used for coloring. Mm -hmm. And so when the dye the fabric. of the, the dye in the fabric fades away, that is the, a kind of viraga. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the fading away of attachment or lust from mm -hmm. the mind is viraga. Mm -hmm. And then when that process of viraga is completed, then what remains is vimuti. Liberation. Oh, that's excellent, Bhante. Yeah. That's excellent. Thank you so much. It's very yeah, clear. It's, it seems in that sutta that's come down in the Anguttara Nikaya in various versions, it seems one factor is like missing. It should be from viraga comes vimuti, then from vimuti comes the knowledge and vision of vimuti. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That makes yes. sense. Yeah. Totally. Mm hmm. Thank you, Venerable. That was fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're Very welcome. grateful. You're welcome. Okay. Let's see. Um, so, Actually, Ken, another, another we'll take your question, question yeah. and then maybe one more from Trisha. Um, Ken, you're still muted, so please okay. unmute yourself. There you go. Okay, thanks. I'm a, a newer teacher in a Sangha and have been involved with teaching some basic introduction to mindfulness meditation classes through a local community college and through other programs. And I have found that at best, we're probably helping people learn to calm their mind a little bit. 
but maybe not so much understand anything beyond knowing, <clears throat> being aware of objects of mind and realizing there's an observer and that which is observed. And so, but my question is this, and I've seen, I've been in classes and I've helped teach classes and I've never seen any um, emphasis on ethics uh, as con being conveyed in, in such a class at any point in the class. And I just want to get your thoughts on it, bringing up that topic within the realms of a, a secular mindfulness class and how might one go about doing that? So I think it's so important. I mean, you can't really make any progress as, as we know, right? Without a good ethical discipline as much as we can. Yes, I mean, you're, you're asking a person <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who has a pretty strong feeling about ethics. Uh -huh. And, and yes, Ken, I, I agree. I think that it is to speak strictly to people about mindfulness may be a, a beneficial thing in terms of, you know, as you said, having them get started, maybe having them learn a little bit about uh, how to calm their minds or how to observe even what's going on in their minds and bodies. And yet it's like you're giving a person a hammer and you have, what if they need a screwdriver? <laughs> you really, it's like, it's so incomplete and, and the ethics is so fundamental to the entire endeavor to, again, just think about if you're living a life in which you're setting up all kinds of horrible karma consequences, then it is just you know, your, your practice is kind of a drop in the, in the bucket of full of salt, as the Buddha said, right? Like you put, you put a, a tablespoon of salt in a glass of water and it's going to be very salty. So, so um, you're putting all that negative karmic impetus, karmic momentum into your life, you know, and that's, that's the practice is just not going to be able to really make you know that much uh uh impact on you because of the other impacts that are happening on you right the vipaka the the ripening of the the ripening consequences of the karmic momentum is just going to be constantly dragging you down so but and again talking about hope you know the anybody can change anybody can stop at any moment and say okay i'm going to live a more ethical life right the Buddha went to Angulimala and said, okay, you have to stop being a serial killer. You have to stop. And when you stop, then you can see that the path will benefit you. And it did, in fact, right? So I agree. I think it's necessary to bring up ethics when we talk about uh, any kind of spiritual development, let alone, um, you know, development in terms of being able to um, uh, you know, train the mind to be more perceptive of reality. Yeah. Okay, you've inspired me to bring this up to our teachers council and, and get this something in place, some mm -hmm. message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wonder if I could. Yes, please, Bonte. Yes. Yeah, I think if one is teaching like mindfulness in a secular context, you wouldn't bring up like saying, I'm going to teach you Buddhist ethics. <laughs> and these are the precepts that you have to observe. But what you would do is say that for the mindfulness practice to really fulfill its aim and to bring satisfactory results, it has to be based upon a certain ethical foundation. And then I would say, bring up maybe the, the, the first four precepts not speaking about them as precepts that you formally undertake these precepts, but if you're going to undertake this practice, you should make a commitment to not killing and of course to not stealing and no, no sexual misconduct, which is probably a, quite a problematic area for many people. And then no, at least no really harmful types of false speech. And I think people will readily understand that that is sort of the initial stage of, because you purify your mind by first purifying your conduct. And then with that, 
purified conduct as the basis, then you can work on purifying the mind through through mindfulness. Yeah, I think it helps to put it into a spiritual context. And that's the question is, do you it, are you yeah. able to do that a bit within a secular class or not? Right? Because that's what happens, right? Westerners as I was before, you know, like, don't talk to me about, you know, the 10 commandments. I want to hear it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you can't, yeah, you, you have to walk that line. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much for that wonderful input. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Trisha, one more question and then maybe I'll do a bit of chanting and we'll close out for that. Okay. Morning. I have a request for, Suggestions for moments when one feels oneself slipping into frustration in interactions with others who are also working towards ending suffering in the world, or depression when circumstances seem to not allow for change to less harm in the world. Suggestions for when? Can you can you repeat the question? Yeah, let me read it again. Suggestions for moments when one feels oneself slipping into frustration in interactions with others who are also working towards ending suffering in the world, mm -hmm. or depression when circumstances seem to not allow for change to less harm in the world. Okay, yes. Hmm. Well, so there's the direct method and there's the indirect method. So the, the, the indirect method is to practice a lot of metta and karuna, practice a lot of loving kindness and compassion. Whether you do the recitation form or you do the meditation form, uh, either way, it's very, very helpful to just come back to establishing that intention for yourself. And again, to finding that pleasant feeling, those pleasant feelings around um, kindness and, and compassion. And, uh, and that's the indirect method because what that's doing is that it's establishing the basis of the mind or you could say it's resetting the tendencies of the mind in accord with your intention, right? And so, but your intention is not to, is, is um, you know, to embody that in the world rather than embodying the frustration or, or the depression. Yeah. So, so that's one way to address it is to um, definitely do lots of Brahma Vihara practice. And then, you know, more directly. Um, so when one way to think about anger is that um, anger comes when our sense of self is challenged in some way. Anger comes up when we feel that you know our will is thwarted or that um, there's some way that we're being impinged upon or that we are being held up in an unfavorable light or various ways it's often almost always i would say related to this sense of the self being challenged so in that case, you can you can do a couple of things. You can have a look first of all at what is it, what is what is the thing that's challenging you in that moment. Is it really a challenge? Is it really that um, true or important or present? You can check in with those things. Um, you can remind yourself of the harm of anger. So, uh, you know. The Buddha referred to anger, getting angry at another person as like picking up a hot coal to throw it at someone, right? So who is it that gets hurt first? The person who picked up the hot coal gets hurt first. Right? So you can remind yourself of the unpleasantness for yourself of the frustration of the anger and the, the, uh, the feelings of that. And um, if you really get that, if you really accept that as true for yourself, then you'll find ways to let go of anger and still be effective and still be talking about whatever is the thing that's important to you. Because I think oftentimes that is what happens is that 
um, we don't, we're not sure, maybe we don't feel confident that we can address a situation without the anger. Yeah. So we use the anger as a way to like screw up or to, to bolster our courage or to make our voice louder or to do something. And yet, you know, uh, that's just adding something into the situation which isn't necessary. You know, I think about, for example, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, telling his folks, just stand here, just stand here quietly. You know, in the face of incredible difficulty and harm and, and, uh, and his knowing the power of that and, you know, sort of giving them the courage of the group to help them through that. And that it was ultimately, to some degree, effective. I know that many people are frustrated with the parts that haven't been quite as effective or things that feel like they've gone backwards these days. But, but, uh, but it did have a very great power in that time. So also remind yourself about the power that you have without anger. And as for depression, so, so um, it's a complex phenomena and I don't want to try to simplify it at all. But what I will say is that um, uh, it's very important to get help when you're feeling depressed because, and it's one of the hardest things to do because you don't want to, because you're depressed. I understand that that's how that works. Um, still, it's, very, it's good to get help, professional help with that. Um, if, you're, if you're feeling you know, very deeply depressed. Um, and I would say one of the things to think about when you're feeling depressed is to try to be very clear about observing uh, the Vedana, the feeling tone of things in your world. And I say that because, and it's a, it, it's a skill, it might take time to learn if you aren't doing some of that kind of practice already. But I say that because what we find in the course of a day, no matter how bad things are going, what we find in the course of a day is we find variations in the flavor. There will be some color that looks beautiful, or there will be some flavor that still tastes good, or there will be some something that you can find in your experience. And it's, it's just important to observe that, to continue to observe that because depression can feel like it's one solid block of negative feeling tone. And it's, and it's, it's helpful. One of the ways we can use our practice of mindfulness and investigation is to notice, oh, it's actually not like that. Don't let myself be convinced that it's a solid block or that it's permanent or that the next moment is necessarily going to be as difficult as the last. Okay, beautiful. So uh, with that, I think we'll stop with the, uh, we'll, we'll take a pause with questions and answers. And I would like to chant the Metta Sutta for you again. And I'm gonna chant the English version this time. And, um, or the English version that I know. Um, and uh, let's see, can I bring this up on the screen? It might take me a minute. So I think I'd rather not. I just chant it for you. If some of you know it or know a similar version, then please, by all means, feel free to chant along. Um, or should we... Uh, Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to chant this as a closing. So I'd like to share the merits, dedicate the merits of our practice today to the well being and freedom from mental and physical suffering of all beings, known and unknown, seen and unseen. And special care for anyone you might be holding in your hearts at this time, or any beings.
This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views. The pure hearted one having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world. All right, friends, beautiful. So let me just uh, speak a little bit about what's going to be happening later in the day. So we're continuing on with our retreat. And so We'll be back here at 2 p.m., about three hours from now, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific U.S. Time. And uh, we will uh, receive some teachings from Venerable Bodhi, Venerable Bhante Bodhi, thank you. And uh, then again, we have an evening session at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific Time. So... Uh, we will uh, be back here at this same Zoom and we will practice the way together then. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Please be well. We'll see you in a little bit. Thank you, Aya. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.